Um, as Margaret said, my name is Charo Neville. I'm the curator of the Kamloops Art Gallery. Um, and I will be leading the second half of our tour. Um, but it's a great honor for me to be able to introduce Maya Wilson Sanchez, who Margaret uh, mentioned has come all the way from New York. Uh, she made it here in between snowstorms, thankfully. Um, and I'm just going to give you a bit of information about Maya and then she's going to take it from there and start with a tour of Double Vision. Um, so Maya Wilson Sanchez is a curator and writer based in between Ottawa and New York. Um, they were part of the curatorial team for Double Vision, serving as the curatorial project coordinator, working with Candace Hopkins. Um, Maya's curatorial practice focuses on processes of history making and building connections between local and international communities to foster networks of exchange and solidarity, as you'll see in this exhibition. Uh, they were an editorial resident at Canadian Art, a curatorial resident at the Art Museum at the University of Toronto, and associate editor at C Magazine. Um, Maya received the 2020 Middlebrook Prize for Young Canadian Curators. Amazing. <laughs> and <laughs> and was, uh, was also a 2021 participant at the Tate Intensive in London, UK. Um, it's a very long and impressive bio. <laughs> Maya worked in numerous art galleries, uh, has worked in numerous art galleries and museums, including the AGO, Gallery TPW, On-Site Gallery MKG 127, and the Textile Museum of Canada, um, and has curated exhibitions at X Space Cultural Centre, the Royal Ontario Museum, and the Art Gallery of Guelph. Um, so she's come all the way across Canada to be with us. Um, and most recently, Maya served as one of the curators for Toronto's Year of Public Art, curating the 2021-2022 exhibition series, I Am Land, um, and curated replicas and reunions, ancient and contemporary ceramics from Ecuador, where Maya is from, um, just this last spring at the Gardner Museum. Um, and Maya's upcoming show and research is based on an exhibition, History Making Machines, Anti-Colonial Mu Museums, by artists, and that opens next year in New York City. So we'll all have to travel there. Um, so I'm going to hand the mic over to Maya now. Thank you. thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you all for coming um, and spending some time tonight. I am from Kichwakaranki territory, and it's my first time on Sequetmik land, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, so Double Vision is curated by Candace Hopkins as part of the Toronto Biennial. And the Toronto Biennial, if you're not familiar with the Biennial, it started just four years ago, if my math is correct. It's very new, it's very exciting for the city of Toronto. And Candace was the curators, uh, she was one of the curators for the first two iterations. And so this show was created in the second iteration of the Biennial. And the biennial um, has its sort of main exhibition, but it also has um, collaborators and it, it collaborates with different institutions all over the city. And for this iteration, it collaborated with the wonderful, the wonderful people at the Textile Museum of Canada. And so this was up while the Toronto bi Biennial was up and it's still going. I believe it's the only traveling exhibition that made it out of any of the biennials so far. So it's really exciting to see its life continue as it travels across Canada. So Double Vision is centered on the practice of Jessie Unark and two of her daughters, Jenik Hehusiuk and Victoria Manguk Sulabuk. When new economies were being generated in Nunavut to replace the fur, the fur trade and local indigenous economies, foremost among them was handicrafts. In the 1940s and 1950s, the federal government invested as much into the production of handicrafts as they did into stone carving and later printmaking. Handicrafts were firmly the domain of women who immediately saw the potential of ni, uh, Nivan Yuliak, and this is the word for wall hanging. Unark and her daughters lived in Nunavut during a time of radical change. 
Unark was born in 1906 in Trantry Inlet, where for decades her and her family lived, moving between different hunting camps in the summer and winter months. During the period of starvation in the 1950s, she and her family had to move to Kamatiguak, meaning where the river widens, which is also known as Baker Lake in English. Here, colonial settlements were introduced alongside a stationary way of living, you know, new stationary housing, a day school, and an Anglican school. It was during this time that the Department of Northern Affairs and National Resources established arts program in order to generate economic development in the North. So, in that historical context, we place this exhibition and it highlights the role of women that in these new economies and follows matrilineal connect connections in this development where women mentored one another to produce unique conceptual and aesthetic lineages. The Sesebiction, in a way, is a family reunion. It's really great to get to bring together these works because now they belong across different collections all over the country. So I worked really closely with um, the collections of uh, the Canada Art Bank, for example, with private collectors, uh, with private collections, um, and they've been really wonderful in letting the show tour. So it's wonderful to see all this work come together, the work of three women, actually I should say four, because we also have a video that you'll get to see in the other side of the gallery of Gail Kabluna, who is actually Victorious's granddaughter. So here we have three generations of Inuk artists. So going back to this historical context, I think one of the things that makes this exhibition quite interesting is that it brings together a domestic context for creative exchange with newly introduced ideas of an artist workshop and art classes that came along with the establishments of art cooperatives. So here, especially in the very early work that we see with Unark, for example, you see this coming together. You can almost picture her in her home making clothing for her family while at this, maybe at the same table she's making these wall hangings. Um, with that, I think we'll move into what I like to call the igloo room or the yellow room. So if you can take a minute and I'll meet you in this room here. So in 1966, the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs gave Unark a studio and a modest salary. Her work became quickly introduced to the Canadian art world. And today, I think we can arguably say that she is the most or at least one of the most influential Inuit textile artists. All of her surviving children, uh, of which they were eight, became artists, and together they formed the, corner store, the cornerstone of artistic production in the community of Kamatiwak. Unark began drawing through the encouragement of a Canadian biologist in the summer of 1959, who provided her with paper and colored pencils with the promise to pay her for each drawing that she produced. Earlier in the year, Unar casually declared that she could draw better than students studying in art school. This was very good timing because by 1960, the federal government had embarked on establishing this art industry in Baker Lake that I previously mentioned. For those who are in the back, you're very lucky to take a look at one of the first drawings that Unark made. So this drawing alongside a print in the next room that I will highlight cemented her assured sophisticated line and form and depictions of women. These two works are really important because out of four works, these two were included in the 1960 Cape Dorset collection and catalog. The Cape Dorset shop was part of efforts to increase economic activity alongside the new West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative. In a testament to her skill, Unark was the only artist outside of Kingate featured in the Cape Dorset print edition. I should also mention that you may see the word Eskimo in some of 
the labels, like I just mentioned, I just did want to note that this is an outdated term for most Inuit, but it was used in this context. So just because of that, I, I will use this. I actually think that's the only time, time I use this word, but I did want to mention it is not used anymore. So going back to this beautiful drawing in the back of the room, Inland Eskimo women relies on elegant line work, revealing angular lines along the shoulders, a long decorative fringe, and a longer hood, all indicative designs of this region. It highlights the unique clothing of inland women living in the region of Baker Lake, which is the only inland community in Nunavut. This work is quite important because it highlights the Amauti. And the Amauti is this beautiful parka that women in this region of Nunavut wear. And it's quite long, and it actually has a little pouch behind the hood where you place your baby. So you can go about your day with your baby in the back. This print is also significant as it reveals her early interest in representing women and their dress, which would become a frequent subject for Jessie. The artist became known in the community for her bold fashion choices, wearing brightly colored headscarves and patterns, particularly when the sales of her artworks enabled her to purchase new fabric. Jessie's work often features relationships between people. When it comes to textiles, and none of it regional styles developed all over and if you go from inlet to inlet or hamlet, you see these kinds of differences. The artists in Baker Lake, they were known for their bright stitched duffel works, often featuring cutout images, centering on the dynamics and interrelationships between peoples, animals, and spiritual world. In Kamanituak, women mentored one another, and in this particular case with Unark's family, creating what is distinctly a matriarchal practice. So the wall hangings that you see by Unark in this exhibition is made with duffel. It is a tightly woven, heavyweight fabric made from wool, featuring a distinct rough texture on both sides. It's kind of like felt, but a bit stronger and rougher. In this work here, which is called Double Igloo, and I think an inspiration for the title of the exhibition, we see a kind of mirroring, a symmetry that you see throughout Unar's work. This kind of mirroring becomes a methodology in her work. And the artist Jack Butler said that their approach to drawing was through pattern and shape rather than lines. For me, the kind of mirroring or doubling that we see in her work can also, I think, draw connections with her practice as someone who made clothing. When you make a piece of clothing, you need a front and a back, and you need two sides, and they mirror each other. So I think that you know, if we can go back to the exercise of picturing Unark in her workshop, we can see perhaps her making a coat with two sides and then making an igloo with two sides at the same time. I wanted to quickly move to this work here. At some point in her life, shortly after moving to Baker Lake, Jessie converted to Christianity. And I want to point out a quote by Jessie here at the top. She says, I remember being told off because I believed in little pieces of paper that tear easily. They used to tell us to be quiet and not read the stories and not have anything to do with them. Jessie worked as a janitor in the Anglican Church at Baker Lake. And I need to mention that the Christian religion divided the community of Baker Lake with some uh, becoming Christian and some being and some folks being very much against that. One of the things that's also interesting about this quote, if we think of the materiality of the work that makes up Unark's practice, as we'll see a little bit in in this room and then in the next room, she is. A mixed media artist. She's working in textiles, she's working in drawings and in printmakings. 
And when I was working on the show, I remember coming across the story of how one of the critiques for Christianity up north was that the Holy Word was written on paper. And paper is this ephemeral, this very easy to tear, easy to sort of fall apart material. And it was very confusing as to why your most important scripture would be within such an ephemeral material. And here, again, we can go back to thinking about the little pieces of paper and perhaps thinking of how Unark then makes a career from these little pieces of paper. I did want to point out before we move to the next room that here we see another example of the Amauti coats that we saw in her earlier drawing in the back. We see a scene of the church surrounded by people, by women, wearing traditional clothing from Baker Lake. In this room as well, you also see some amazing wall hangings by Victoria. I I'm a big fan of Victoria's work and I really appreciate the humor that she, she brings into her work. So here, um, this work is called The Women with Too Many Children, perhaps a comment on her mom and, and all her brothers and sisters. We'll see some drawings by Victoria as well in the other part of the exhibition, but I did want to mention, again, as this um, mixed media artist, we can pay attention to how she uses um, colored pencil in a very similar way that she uses embroidery. So I encourage you um, in, in after the, the tour, but also if you have a minute before we move to the next room, to pay attention to the embroidery in both of her works here. You see the very fine embroidery that she uses to give clothing texture and to create movement within the works. So I think that's all for this room. I will meet you on the other side of this wall. So I really love this room because I think in this space you can really get a sense of what I was talking about with the vast variety in materials that these three artists work with. Um, especially if you take a look over here in the tissue works by Janet that I'll talk about in a bit. So in the show we have textiles, right? Duffel, embroidered and applique, on paper, we have pastels, colored pencil drawings, we have tissue, acrylic polymer, and we have stone cut and stencil prints. What I find fascinating is how this exhibition highlights the artist's work in, in this, what we, you could call an intermedial fashion, and thinking about how different representations, whether if it's of women or animals, how they come into being say in textiles or in drawings or prints especially if you look at one artist and you kind of see how she approaches the same subject matter but in different materials it's something fascinating to do when you have more more time in the gallery space i did want to point out so the two prints that i mentioned by by unark the very two early prints that made it into the cape dorset exhibition the other one is here on the right um, called Tattooed Faces. These are two wonderful wall hangings by Jesse Unarg. Here again, you can see the kind of doubling, or in this case, quadrupling of subject matter. One of the things that I wanted to point out in this wall hanging, although you can also find this in the church wall hanging in the previous room, are these shapes here. So these triangle-like shapes is actually referring to the ulu. And the ulu is a knife that is common in this part of the world. It's usually used by women. And it's an all-purpose knife traditionally used by Inuit women, used for skinning and cleaning animals, cutting a child's hair, cutting food, trimming blocks of snow, and in this case, to make clothing, to make art, to make these 
wonderful wall hangings. So you see these in the church hanging in the previous room as they sort of envelop and live within these representation of women. But I wanted to point them out in this context. And as you can see, they're literally attached to people's heads. And I really appreciated this gesture by Unark because you can see her tool of art making as a literal part of herself, as an extension of the human body. Now, I'm gonna ask you all that you sort of remain in this space because it gets pretty tight here, but I am gonna be referring to some of the works on this side. So the works in this pink wall, especially the works by Janet, is what I'm gonna be talking about next. So this room is an exploration of pattern on paper by Janet Kehusiuk. Janet's practice is centered on the relationship between representation and abstraction. Janet began making collages later in her life, which was easier than making textiles as she, was, as she developed arthritis. And this became a way to further represent the land and life around her with a focus on interlacing of shape and color. What I really love about this show, and I think here we're drawing a little bit from Janet. Oh, and I should also mention that all the colors that you see in the exhibition design, the reds and the yellows and the pinks, we worked very closely with our exhibition designer to actually put, pull these colors from the artworks themselves. And I think looking at the design of the show, looking at the works in the show, looking at the way that Janet is representing land, you really get to understand how the Arctic is not white. And I think that's a very popular image of the Arctic, of the North that lives in the popular imaginary of people. But I think this show propositions a different view, and I think you can see this very clearly in Janet's work. She was known to be inspired by the in-between time at dusk and dawn, and how the shifting light brought out different characteristics in the land. Her works on paper, the in-between time here was represented through a rhythm she achieved through the proximity of forms and through the land itself, the land becoming a sort of pattern. And after the tour, when you have a moment to come around this corner, um, we actually have a didactic just on pattern. And if I could, I'd wanna share a brief anecdote about my time putting together this exhibition with the rest of the folks at the textile museum. And I got to work really closely with the translators um, to translate all, all the stuff that you see into English and Inuktitut. And when I was working with the French translator, she emailed me because she didn't know what we meant by pattern. She asked, do you mean, you know, a repeating motif or do you mean the pattern to make a dress or a piece of clothing. And I really thought about this and the show and the background of the artist, and I said, both. And then she said, well, you can't have that in French, so we had to pick one. <laughs> um, but going back to Janet, she was interested in representing the land, particularly that of her family's summer camp at Kitikat. There she portrayed the water, swarms of mosquitoes, lichen, and the drying of fish. Her landscapes became represented by large swaths of color resembling color field paintings, but rooted in her very personal experience of land and of, the, of this place. She used the tissue to represent particular places, like the bright blue lake of Aupauk Tuluk. These collages, like the detailed drawings she became known for, show the Arctic landscape as one with rich color and texture, revealed through close looking and her intimate attention to the land's details. In her works on paper, the in-between time was represented through a rhythm achieved via the proximity of forms and the land as a pattern. 
I want to speak about Victoria's work, and you got to see some of her wall hangings in the igloo room. After I'm done the tour, you can see some of her really incredible drawings around the corner, but it's quite tight. So if you're patient with me, I'll just speak a little bit about them. So in both Jessie's and Victoria's work, you see an interest in the animal human world and the spirit world. As you know, Jessie converted to Christianity, but kept depicting Inuit stories and events, which we might call a kind of cultural or religious syncretism, which is also very common for me back home. Both Jesse and Victoria were warned against representing spirits in the idea that their work could summon the spirits, invite them forth. But all of these artists did it anyway, which is kind of fearless. The reason Victoria Mangsulawuk's work is so rich in story is that she was one of her, the only siblings who would stay up deep into the night listening to the tales of her grandmother, Natak, who lived with the family. Over the course of her career, Victoria often returned to the same character, Kivyuk. Kivyuk was a traveler, an explorer, a migrant. He travels through different lands as well as through different times and different cultures. He is one of the oldest feature, uh, figures in Inuit oral history, and his stories likely go back thousands of years. He's a little bit of a trickster, a little bit of a joker, and he is known to resurface at significant moments. For example, he's known to have intercepted a Soviet satellite flying over the Arctic during the Cold War. And remember that during this time, the Canadian Arctic was the front line, and Inuit were, hand, were first hand witnesses. After many lives in the world of the white man, Kibiuk finally returned home to forewarn what he saw while he was away. In these stories, real and imaginary overlap in ways that can confuse interpretation by outsiders. For Inuit, people and spirits commonly share the same environment. Mansu Willaluk's prints, drawings, and textiles are no exception. We see humans convening with snake spirits. You'll see in one work, there a person emerges from the body of a yellow serpent. The fish are monstrously large, and people are often in a state of transformation, sometimes mutating into seals or birds, while animals in turn become human. Importantly, Victoria herself says, all that is described in these stories really did happen once when everything in the world was different to what is now. My favorite moments in Victoria's work are these moments of transformation or change where she shows the human and the non-human as one. Victoria was a visual chronicler of these stories, and we can argue that her sister and her mother were also chroniclers on, her, on their own right with their own distinct interests. After I finish the tour and invite you to go into this room and take a look at her depictions of wolves and wolves people. One story centers a man who was married to a wolf and is related to the greater arc of stories that feature Kivyuk. In other stories represented in one of the images, children are raised by wolf people when the man of the family is out searching for his wife. In a videotaped interview with artist Jack Butler, Victoria revealed that both Kivyuk's wife and his envious mother-in-law were also wolf people, and that Kivyuk himself had a wolf for a wife at one time. In the very back, in the center of the room, you'll also see a depiction of Sedna, who is the goddess of the sea and marine animals in Inuit mythology. I think that's where I'll end. I want to say thank you all for coming again, and thank you so much for the staff at the Kamloops Art Gallery. I feel so lucky to be able to travel here and celebrate with you all the opening of these exhibitions. Thank you so much. And I'll stick around if you have any questions after the tour. Thank you.